Good afternoon. Welcome to the first debate run by Pabasa and uh, the Pius Langa School of Advocacy. As you know, the title of today's debate is the intersection of law, politics and leadership in South Africa's judicial decision making. My name is Nasreen Raja Badlinder. I'm the chairperson of Pabasa and I'm very pleased today to welcome you all. We have a wonderful turnout for today's event. In fact, the event was oversubscribed and we had to stop it at 500 people. So um, we're very happy to have people join us from, from around the country. In preparation for today, I was pondering why the response to this event has been so positive. And I think in part, it's because of the quality of our esteemed panelists and the varied positions that they bring to this debate. But I think it's also a reflection of the place we are in South Africa at the moment and of the genuine desire by South Africans to understand and to engage with the role of the various branches of our government. So to tell you a little bit first about Pabasa, Pabasa was formed um, about three years ago as the first bar of advocates post-democracy in South Africa with a very clear focus on transforming the legal profession um, to create a professional space where black and female advocates feel supported and recognized. The Pius Langa School of Advocacy is an important part of Pabasa. Uh, it's an independent school, which is accredited with the Legal Practice Council uh, to conduct training, particularly for advocates, but we also do training for, for attorneys. Um, and our school board is chaired by Justice Besson Kabinde, who, as you'll know, is a former justice of the Constitutional Court. A core part of Pabasa and of the training that the Pius Langa School offers is our commitment to engaging openly and constructively in an effort to learn and to grow as lawyers, but also as human beings. And central to this, is the ability to respectfully be able to discuss contested and controversial issues with those who sometimes might hold a very different view and to be able to come out of that process having learned more about the opposite position and having had to question one's own assumptions and beliefs in that process. And we believe this makes us stronger lawyers and also better citizens. It's not always an easy process but it is necessary and it's important. So our aim today with this debate is not to cause sensation or controversy. That may be what many of you attending were hoping to see. But in truth, the aim of today's debate is to educate and to allow you to be exposed to a series of contrasting views and then to reach your own conclusions. Now, panelists are well known and they're highly respected. They come from quite a different backgrounds and perspectives, and we hope that this makes for an interesting and engaging debate. I'm happy to say also that our panelists today are overwhelmingly women. So let me introduce you to them. Our first panelist is um, Professor Tuli Madonsela. Professor Madonsela is the former public protector of South Africa. She is currently occupying the research chair in social justice studies at Stellenbosch University. I first came to meet Professor Madonsela when I represented her, I was one of her advocates in a, in a series of cases. And what I remember and what struck me most about her at the time was her commitment to reading and considering every word of every affidavit um, and to analyzing judgments and considering the impact of those judgments carefully. So I have no doubt that Professor Madonsela will bring her own unique perspective to today's debate, uh, and we welcome you, Professor Madonsela. Our next panelist is Dr. Claudel von Eck. Dr. von Eck is a leadership specialist, and she's the founder of a company called Brave Inflections, whose core focus areas are to encourage ethical and courageous leaders. Through Brave Inflections, she facilitates good governance, leadership, and whistleblower support. She's a sought after keynote speaker and she's also an executive coach and facilitator. Dr. Von Eck will no doubt have, have much to share with us about the role of ethical leadership in relation to law and politics. Welcome Dr. Von Eck. Our next panelist is uh, Kim Heller. 
Uh, Kim is a writer and a political analyst. Her book, No White Lies, Black Politics and White Power in South Africa, has attracted equal parts of controversy and praise. She is known for her challenge to white South Africans to recognize and acknowledge the persistence of privilege and the need for reparations, as well as for casting a light on structural racism and the lack of social and economic transformation in South Africa. Ms. Heller has been a member of the ANC and also part of the EFF leadership in Gauteng in the past. We look forward to her perspective on the debate today too. Our next panelist is Aubrey Machiki, who is a Sangoma and a political analyst. He's widely respected for his intellectual analysis and for his independent thought. Whenever I read a column or hear Gogo Machikli speaking, I'm struck by the fearless independent approach he brings to all issues and how he challenges us to question our assumptions. Now, for those of you who might know them, um, our, our last panelist, Muzi Skakane SC and Aubrey Machikli may have been part of the same MK unit in a, pre a previous life, in a former life, but we also know that they don't always agree. And in fact, more often than not, they disagree. So we're looking forward to a robust and engaging debate between them two. Gogo Machiki, welcome. Thank you for sharing your views. Our last panelist, Muzi Skakane SC, is one of the founding members of Pabasa. He's a respected senior counsel. He holds degrees in law and a master's in political science. What many don't know is that uh, in his heart, he's a teacher and an activist. He's also an avid reader of books. He's a student of history and politics. Now, Muzi may be known for having previously represented former President Jacob Zuma, but his work for President Zuma was in fact a small part of his practice, which includes representing a range of clients across the political spectrum, and a large component of the work that he does is social justice and human rights work. So that is our panel today. We look forward to a stimulating debate. Um, participants are welcome to type questions in the Q&A section of the screen. Our moderator will, time permitting, put some of those questions to the panelists towards the end of the session. So I'd now like to hand over to Vuyani Ngalwana SC who is a member of Pabasa and who is equally well known for expressing his own strong views on social media. I expect that he will have some interesting, very thoughtful questions to put to our panelists. Thank you to everyone for attending today. I hope you enjoy the debate. Fuyani, over to you. Thank you, Nazreen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I have discussed the, uh, the process or the format of the debate with the uh, panelists. Uh, just, just to let everyone know that the first 30 or so minutes will be the opening statements by each of the panelists. Each panelist will have up to five minutes uh, to give us their opening statements. Then the next 40 or so minutes will be the actual debate where I'll be instigating the debate. Um, during that stage, I'll be putting questions to each panelist. The panelists will have some time to answer the question. And if any of the other panelists wants to add something or disagree with the panelist, that panelist will be given an opportunity. And then the first panelist who answered the question will be given an opportunity to reply. And then in the last time permitting 20 or 30 minutes, the third segment of the debate, you sitting at home or at the office or on a flight to Dubai, will have an opportunity to put your questions in writing, uh, which will be screened through to me um, to read out and put to whomever the question, for whomever the question is intended. And so without further ado, as the politicians tend to say, I open the floor to each of the panelists to make their opening statements. I shall start with Professor Madonsela, and then followed by um, Gogo Machiki. The third panelist will be Muzi Sikakane SC. The fourth will be Ms. Kim Heller. And then we'll round off with Dr. Von Eck. Um, Prof, your opening statements, please. Five minutes.
Thank you, Advocate Viani Galana, Habasa, and the Pius School of Advocacy for the privilege to be part of this panel. And thank you also for creating an opportunity of this nature for us to review the judges. We always say that everyone else is accountable to someone. Who does the judiciary account to? It's opportunities such as this that give us an opportunity to rationally engage with decisions of judges. It has already been indicated I am currently working at Stellenbosch University as Chair in Social Justice Research. Incidentally, that has always been my home. The very first thing I ever did publicly was about social justice, and you don't want to know when, because that reminds you that I've been alive for quite some time. But my reflections, therefore, although we're looking at leadership and the intersection between leadership um, law and in politics, I will specifically focus on um, I'll specifically focus on reflections on social justice leadership dimensions of the decision of the Constitutional Court in the matter that led to President Zuma being found guilty of contempt. The starting point is just understanding what is social justice as I understand it. And it's the same understanding of social justice I have been working with for quite some time. At the Chair in Social Justice Studies, we understand social justice broadly as Rawls, John Rawls put it in the 70s to mean fairness to all. But specifically, our definition is that social justice is about the just, fair, and equitable distribution of all opportunities, resources, benefits, privileges, and burdens in a society and between societies. And of course, this would be reflected in equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms. And I do think that this particular case raises questions around what lessons are we getting from the Constitutional Court about its role in social justice leadership in dealing with the rule of law and supremacy of the Constitution in such a manner that there is fairness to all and that there's equal feeling of burdens in society, benefits and privileges in society. Let's start at the beginning very quickly, knowing of course that I have limited time. The beginning starts with uh, the decision of the Constitutional Court. We know that 78%, percent of Constitutional Court decision of, of, sorry, of constitutional court judges have decided that President Zuma must go to jail for, 50, for 15 months. What people are not aware of is that 100% of the constitutional court judges that sat as a bull bench decided that President Zuma was guilty of contempt of court. And then only 22%, 22 22.2% of these judges decided that President Zuma should not go to jail, even though he's guilty of contempt of court, and, they, and, and decided that a coercive order would have worked better. Now, I just want to talk to you only about the majority decision, what are we learning from it? What I'm taking from a social justice point of view is that the majority decision had to do a balancing of the rights of President Zuma as, as the respondent in this matter and, and the rights of everyone, the rights in terms of how they're treated by the courts, 
rights in terms of being able to live in a stable democracy where the rule of law holds everything together. We will remember that Adam Smith said, justice is what keeps society to together. And when justice fails, society and everything, the fabric of society crumbles like atoms. It was a difficult exercise though, that was done by the Constitutional Court. I look at it as an approach that is very sim similar to when the Constitutional Court was faced with the death penalty in SSS Mokwanyan, walking in the shoes of the accused person, or in this case, walking in, in, in the shoes of the person condemned uh, for, for murdering someone, but also looking at what does it mean for the rest of society. And in this particular case, everyone found a President Zuma guilty of contempt of court, but it was a question of what then are we going to do about it? And the, the minority judgment, which obviously is an opinion because only the majority judgment is the judgment, says that uh, maybe a, a, a coercive sentence was equally competent. I'm gonna say to you just in closing that like Lord Denning, my approach on reviewing the decisions of the Constitutional Court are based on looking at how reasonable is this judgment? How rational is this judgment? And it's not about would I have judged differently? Is the judgment on its own sound and standing? And I must indicate dear colleagues that I, found, I find no fault in it. I find the judgment to be, to be sound because the arguments around a coercive um, a sanction being untenable do make sense given the history of this case, given the engagement uh, uh, between former President Zuma and the court. And then lastly, there's been in the, in the second judgment, a comparison between the Porter case and this. Just from a social justice point of view and from a rationality point of view, um, that comparison doesn't come into place. Here we're talking about contempt of court. There it was contempt of the, con of the commission of the TRC. Here is contempt of the highest court of the land. And therefore you're looking at if this person is contempt of the highest court of the land, if you take this matter further down, what really are you trying, are you going to be trying to achieve? So that's something that I think that we need to look at. Just ultimately, I want to say to you, dear colleagues, Judge Edwin Cameron once said, judges are not ideological virgins. This is in a book called Ideological Virgins. Eventually he himself became a judge. And I do think that judges are not ideological virgins. And that can be seen in the tension, in the wording of the, the two judgments. But that said, I do think that the majority judgment did its best, was rational, reasonable, and fair in balancing the rights of President Zuma and the dictates of upholding the supremacy of the constitution and the rule of law and ensuring that the social justice so that a global Jamini in Tofimbaba knows that if they have a case against a big mayor, or a former mayor in their community, never should they fear that the courts will bend backwards to accommodate the interests of the former mayor whilst the Koko Zamini is left without a remedy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We'll, we'll certainly get to grips um, with the merits of the judgment later. Koko Mochiki. Sati Mandi Kalengo Kut Amakushisa Diti Tobazan. Before I start, um, I think Tuli and I should have been given more than five minutes for our opening remarks because she and I speak slower than the other panelists. Uh, secondly, I am not here 
to argue law. Thirdly, I am not here to agree or disagree with anyone. That said, imagine that South Africa is a country in which Impugane, the fly, is sacred. When a fly is seen, when a fly is spotted, there is celebration, there is joy, there is ululating. But imagine something else. Imagine a fly that is caught in a spider's world. When you look at that fly caught in the spider's web, its body looks intact. What is not obvious is the fact that the spider has hollowed it out. And therefore what you are looking at, you see Pogi Sempugane, the ghost of a fly. Secondly, if it is not common cause, it should be common cause that we, we are here today discussing this constitutional court judgment because former president Jacob Zuma made some choices, political and otherwise, that are injudicious in nature and may have placed us precariously so on the, pre on, on the precipice. Thirdly, I align myself more with the minority judgment than I do with the main judgment. In the same way that uh, Rosa Luxemburg, to paraphrase, to paraphrase her, said that uh, freedom of expression must almost always be reserved for those who differ. It is my view that in its highest form of expression, justice must be reserved for the worst amongst us. And therefore, I was concerned that the, li the right to liberty of uh, the former president is being taken away without taking this into account. Primarily, it is the task of the Constitutional Court to make sure that in its proceedings, the right to liberty is never taken away without the kind of due process the former president was not exposed to. In other words, when the court says it was compelled to find as it did because he did not avail himself, he did not come to the court to make representation as the court had asked. Effectively, what the court is doing is to shift the onus from its duty to that of a citizen. And in my view, that is not good enough. Finally, all sorts of things, all sorts of agendas come disguised as a commitment to democracy. When I look at our democracy at the moment, I am looking at what increasingly is becoming the ghost of a fly. Its insides are being hollowed out by this spider. It will therefore not help to reduce this important moment in our history 
to a single judgment. This judgment must be, must be seen as part of a bigger moment in South Africa's history. And therefore, to the extent that one of the things of which this moment consists is our liberal democratic reality. And the fact that liberal democracy is a lie and a fraud. We must do analyses that are much deeper than the joy that is uncritical I have seen on the part of some in celebrating this judgment. And the anger that is equally uncritical in response to the judgment. Gamako. Thank you, Gogo. I, um, it, was, it was my wish that we are not here going to have an echo chamber. And so I am elated that, that we are beginning to see traces of disagreement already between Gogo Machiki and Professor Madonsela. Professor Madonsela favoring the majority judgment and Gogo Machiki seemingly favoring the minority judgment. So that's exciting for things to come later in the debate. Um, uh, Mr. Sikakane? To unmute. Adrian, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Claire. Thank you, Vianney. I mean, I'm sure people are shocked that I'm going to speak and they think, how can he um, um, so involved in this uh, kinds of matters. Well, I must say as a matter of record, I was not briefed in this matter, but I think it's important to say, I'm going to speak in generalities about the theory of your topic, because to talk about the details of this matter, uh, without be, if we are to be honest, I'm likely to be biased. So I'm going to avoid to deal with the specifics and deal with your topic, which is why there is a controversy every time law intersects with politics and what are we to do with it and what causes that sometimes irrational response. It's because law is an institution that is central to the social nature of human beings. It means when people say, oh, this is not law, this is politics, they're missing that very, very point that it's an offshoot of politics. So it is about regulation of human affairs the adjudication of human disputes, the contradictions between classes in that society. It is also a consequence of human civilization because it's based on the theory that human relations require regulation. And therefore the relationship between the rulers and those who are ruled is called law. I mean, requires law. And therefore, when I say it's an offshoot of politics, I'm trying to deal once and for all with what I think is a false dichotomy that there's law on the one side and politics on the other. The attempt to do that is misplaced. Even a labor dispute, Viani, a labor dispute uh, that seems like law and not politics is actually a dispute between those who own the means of production and those who sell their labor for survival. And that is an offshoot of societal relations. Even a, di a dispute about a lease agreement is actually a disagreement between those who own property and those who don't. And so small conflicts that we think are not politics are between a husband and a wife. They are based on gender relations in a society and that's politics. And so I, I, I zoom in on your topic just to explain what exactly is this relationship and why the dichotomy sometimes we draw is false. And therefore, it is important to note that basically the controversy that happens in cases of the nature that the panelists are discussing with better detail than I, I can because I think I'm biased and I must declare that that conflicts between powerful classes that fight over political power 
and mind share are likely to attract controversy. In this case, and all of the other cases that are political are cases of that nature. They are about the disputes between hidden hierarchies in society that are fighting over mind share and control of the destiny of that society. And therefore, different classes in society fight in court because each one of them wants to create a society in its own image. And those who fight are not always the majority. Sometimes it's a powerful minority using the majority to create a society in its own image. So all the battles are political in nature. And all of these, and, and, and therefore law is a tool to govern political disputes because political disputes are about human relations. What is then the role of law in a formalistic way is to introduce fairness in the regulation of human disputes. All the time, there will be bigger and emotional battles between forces that seek to control a given society. And they come in different cases. They can come in a case between Zuma and somebody else, or between Ace Mahashule and, 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 and his colleagues. But if you analyze them theoretically, these are cases that are just not about law, they're about human relations and control of society and battles for mind share in society and who must prevail. And therefore, these forces, as they seek to be dominant in society, fight and ignite emotions in us. And I think you have 500 people here um, concerned with a debate like this, in this case, they're not concerned about Rodriguez, who's accused of killing our people and pushing them outside the 10th floor of John Foster Square. Somehow they're ignited by the emotion of a case about their leaders. No one knows who represented Walus Walush and Rodriguez currently. But we are all obsessed with this because these are emotional cases and because law is about politics and is absolutely correct that we should be emotional about it because it deals with our affairs. And lastly, this is so because whether we like it or not, law reflects the wishes of a dominant class in society. It doesn't matter that we say, no, the majorities were uh, created the law, basically. And when I say this, I'm not saying that dominant class is wrong. I'm saying law represent the dominant wish in society at a given time. And this can happen in two ways. It's the wishes of a powerful minority or the wishes of a majority. It depends on the scales in that society. And therefore the, the emotions that we have about cases like that are caused by this nature of law and politics and Vianney, I thought I should keep it at that theoretical level as I spoke to you about your topic, because we must understand our emotions and our views in this case, in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Fergus. You, you say you are afraid that you may be biased in as much as you uh, represented Mr. Zuma previously, but one of the least understood um, things about advocates is the ability to argue a case on both sides. Um, we tend not to be emotionally involved in cases. And so when we get to the second segment, I'm afraid I'm gonna push you a bit. I'll leave it to you to say, no, I may not comment on this, but uh, push you, I shall. Thank you, uh, Mr. Skakani. Thank you. Ms. Kim Heller. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very honored to be part of this very august panel. I'm a writer and an advocate for social and economic justice. Many writers pen pleasing and uplifting prose about the Rainbow Nation as a just and an equal society. I'm not one of those writers. My recent book, No White Lies, Black Politics and White Power in South Africa, exposes how we remain a nation 
in the courtesy of whiteness, where the rule of law has a distinct white, old white hue and where justice for black South Africans is not yet in sight. It is my verdict that the judiciary, like all other institutions in South Africa, continues to serve the white master and white interests. And for me, it's important to understand that this is the context in which we must understand the Jacob Zuma judgment. The judiciary this week sentenced Jacob Zuma, a former president of a democratic South Africa, to a prison term longer than that prescribed in law. While F.W. de Klerk, a formal and very unnoble apartheid president, roams free, I would argue then that justice is still born in our new society. What we see is a clear intersection between law and politics in contemporary South Africa. However, the intersection between law and justice appears far less visible. And this is something that I believe should keep our leaders, judges and law academics awake at night. If we were a society truly concerned about justice, we would be asking difficult questions. What about apartheid atrocities? What about Marikana? What about land justice? The principle of equality before the law lies at the very heart of, of the justice system. And we've seen in the last week, many have cited and celebrated the Zuma judgment as a showpiece of equality before the law. As always, I hold a very different perspective. In fact, I argue that Jacob Zuma is unequal before the law. And the judgment itself, in my opinion, offends the very principle of equality before the law. If we just even look at the language of the court, it suggests that Zuma has indeed received unequal treatment. Jacob Zuma has been villainized for years by a partisan and biased media. And we cannot say without a reasonable doubt that this has not deeply contaminated and con un can con deeply contaminated and compromised this judgment. And I just want to, to, to look back at some of the media that we've had about him. Some years ago, a city press editorial described Zuma, the sitting president, as a maggot, probably the lowest of all creatures. And I want to read from this. The editorial reads as follows. We appeal to all those representatives of the people who believe in South Africa to rid the country of this maggot before it eats up the roots of our beloved Republic. Indulge me for a minute. The, dic the, dic the, the dictionary definition of a maggot is as follows. Legless, soft-bodied, worm-like lava of a housefly, often found in decaying matter. I'm sure that many judges read this particular editorial. We must also not forget about how the book, The President's Keeper, was proclaimed as a testimony of truth as a Bible of truth by the public without much scrutiny at all. This book, interestingly, was written by Jacques Pau, who has recently been unmasked as an untruthful individual. I also recall the book by yet another senior white journalist, Adrian Besson, uh, entitled Enemy of the People, where he argued that, uh, that Zuma had sold the country I don't believe that judges don't read these things. I have written about how speaking truth in Ramaphosa's new dawn is a blood sport. It is very dangerous, actually. I can testify to that. But we cannot remain silent on the real possibility of grave, grave injustice in this matter due to judicial com contamination. So as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing to celebrate in this judgment. Those who speak about it being a victory for the rule of law, I ask a victory for who? Why the haste and urgency on this matter? Why the escalation, an unprecedented escalation, if I'm correct, to the constitutional court? Why the overzealous and extreme penalty? And I am possibly ending off on a controversial point. Could it be that the judiciary is Ramaphosa's very own public protector? Could it be that this judgment is sending a clear message to those who oppose the, the new dawn and its interests. 
And the message is simple. If we can deal with Zuma, we can deal with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keller. I would be failing in my duty as a moderator if I didn't hold you to one or two observations that you made, but we won't deal with that currently. I'd like you to think about it for the second segment of the debate. Two statements you've made. The first is the judiciary serves white interests. The second is a rhetorical question as I understand it. Could it be that the judiciary is the president, President Ramaphosa's own public protector, quote unquote? I shall put to you during the second segment of the debate, those two um, quotes from your opening remarks and ask you if you have any factual evidence to back them up. Just think about that. Um, so we will discuss that in due course. Thank you, Ms. Keller. Last but not least, Dr. Von Eck, your opening remarks, please. Thank you, Essi, and um, thank you for the opportunity um, to, have, to be part of this panel um, this afternoon. And firstly, I should commend um, Pabasa for including voices outside of the profession. Um, to ensure that you don't go into an echo chamber with, within the, in, in the profession. Um, that diversity of thought is, is usually important um, in our society. And like Muzi, I'm going to, just in terms of my opening remarks, um, be a little more theoretical. I'm looking through the lens of um, leadership and specifically looking at, at, at the judiciary, but understanding that when we're looking at this case in particular, we've got multiple leaders um, in the game, if it were, if, if, if I can use that um, phrasing for lack of a better one, that when we look through the leadership lens, we, we need to understand what leadership brings um, to the table. Now, leadership by definition means that you have willing followers and a key question there is, who are you leading? And when I was reflecting on this, um, thinking about leadership um, in the context of the judiciary, ju judicial leadership as a concept, um, how well entrenched is that concept and how well do we as a society understand that and what it means? Because you exercise leadership. So leadership is not just a crown that you get because you are, you're sitting in a particular position, but you exercise leadership, it, it, it requires action. And that tends to come in the midst of complexity. And when we're dealing with eth ethical dilemmas and significant consequences. So if, if one were to look at this case, we're sitting with dilemmas here because there are opposing values. And within a society that is as diverse as our society. And I want to uh, a link back to um, what Muzi has said in terms of politics and us as, as, as social beings um, within the context of, of South Africa, with all of us with diff looking through different lenses, whose value is most valuable? Um, when, whose position is the right position? And have we got the ability to look through those different lenses? And in, in, in particular, when we're looking at leadership, leaders must have the ability um, to look through different lenses so that one can have a holistic view of what you have in front of you. So judicial leadership is a concept. And, and when I looked at it, I thought you actually have um, two, a combination of two broad categories. And in, in terms of leadership, there's leadership internally. So you've got a hierarchy and the judges who lead and thought leadership, do they have follow, uh, willing followers? And to use the analogy of the, the fly that was used earlier on, um, do we have thought leadership within that context that is useful to society, that's serving society? Um, the ju uh, jurisprudential leadership, the powers of persuasion and influence, um, is it serving society? 
And of course, in the, the second category, category is the contributing of the shaping of society. And I think here we've got a case that as, is really helping us to start to, to reflect a hell of a lot more around the effect that judgments have on people's lives, but also the outcomes and the degree to which the outcomes thereof can, can affect whole systems. So the ripple effect of one decision on a whole society, and what does that mean? What does it mean in the long run? The manners in which judgments are phrased can influence the minds in broader society. So from that perspective, judges or the judiciary exercising leadership, having a significant impact in terms of doctrinal innovation. Um, and I suppose here you can start to talk about judicial activism, but I leave that conversation for you lawyers, but essentially also the decisions extending into academic thinking and influencing the thinking of our young people and um, the contribution to the development of law. So one would then expect that you, the, the judici judiciary in terms of judicial leadership, that there is um, deep thought in terms of the impact of, of, on society, but also agility. Is the law adapting to a changing society? So we're embedded in a social, political, economic, and technological context that is dynamic and it's constantly changing. And to what degree um, are we adjusting to that? Because the judiciary is as a whole, as a sum of its parts. So as an ecosystem, it either leads well or becomes a burden to a society. And as a question that we would be sitting with in this case, um, what's coming out of this? Is the judiciary leading society well in this regard, or is it becoming a burden to society if one thinks about the potential ripple effects um, in society? And of course, also ethical courage in leadership would one would want to see come through, and that is standing for what is right. Um, not and but at the same time, we mustn't underestimate what dissenting means for a human being, where being ostracized is a real threat. So when you have a minority view, um, we should be celebrating, and, I'm, and here I'm not pronouncing on whether it's right or wrong in terms of the judgment itself, because we'll get into that when we get into the real debate. But are we celebrating and protecting um, dissenting voices because we need that in society to help us think that we don't go into groupthink as a society and understanding the noise in, in the system? So the key question for me, um, as we unpack the the um, the judgment, because one doesn't want to just focus on the jail sentence itself, because there's there's much more involved here, is the contribution from a leadership perspective. Is it serving society or is it not serving society well? Thank you, Dr. Von Eck. There, there is certainly a um, a question of ethics that does, in my view, certainly arise in the course of the judgment. And it's a, it's a question on which I would like you to, to assist us later on in the panel. We are now entering the second segment of the debate, the debate proper. And I want to start with you, Dr. Von Eck. The judgment opens with a curious sentence the majority judgment that is in the very first sentence of the, of the judgments. It reads as follows. It is indeed the lofty and lonely work of the judicial, impervious to public commentary and political rhetoric to uphold, protect and apply the constitution and the law at any and all costs, my underlining, to apply the constitution and the law at any and all costs. Here's my question to you. From a leadership perspective, Dr. Von Eck, what are your views on the judiciary being impervious to public commentary and public rhetoric and applying the law at any and all costs? Are there any leadership um, implications there? I think they are, and I think first and foremost, um, it is important that we look 
at it through the lens of we're looking at human beings. And while it is a very, very noble concept, this concept of you must be agnostic, you must be apolitical, um, I don't think it is possible. So for me, one of the first principles of leadership is your ability to be brutally honest with self and to be able to, to reflect on what is real and what is not real. For me, when I look at that phrase, I think there is a projection of a no, noble intent, but not helpful in that it can be very misleading. Now, we know from research that the average human being, only in terms of your, your conscious mind, that makes up about between 10 and 12%. So what you are consciously aware of only makes up a very small percentage. So if you were to, I like to use the analogy of an iceberg. Um, so the top of the, the tip of the iceberg with, would be what you think, what you consciously think about, and the rest of it sitting under the waterline. That's your subconscious. Your belief systems, the subliminal messages that you, you're getting from, from society, your, the fact that we as human beings don't like being ostracized, the fact that our amygdala is where your instinct would be sitting in terms of fright or flight or freeze. Um, and we, though all of those things happen in the, at the subconscious level when we're not aware. So to say that I am able to be sitting here at the apex and I can have this noble concept and live it is disingenuous because as human beings, none of us can be that. So I, I, I think we, and, and the minute we put ourselves in a box like that, we then start to prevent ourselves from asking those very difficult questions. And that is, what are my unconscious biases in this case that may be influencing my thinking? And if you don't do that, then you're, you will be influenced without you being aware um, that you influenced. And I think history, not just in South Africa, all countries, History is littered with judgments that had an adverse effect on individuals, on groups, on society that were driven by people's ideologies and underlying um, belief systems and so forth. At all cost, that once again for me is a, from a leadership perspective, what you're not taking into consideration are all the, 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 the dilemmas and the implications and the consequences and so forth. Um, can one have a very blinkered view on things? Um, so if we were sitting in 1971 and the judge was saying, we must apply the law at all costs, then you're going to apply the apartheid law at all costs. So where, the, where does the thought leadership come through in, um, in judgments and uh, when judges look at that? Thank you, Dr. Honak. It's, um, it, it's a very curious sentence I found because when I look back to 2012, for those um, attendees who are interested in this and maybe for the panelists as well, there's a judgment of the Constitutional Court by Justice Musenegh. The citation is, it's International Trade Administration Communi Commission versus CAW, SCAW, South Africa PDY Limited. The citation is 2012, volume four of the South African Law Reports, 618, and it's a constitutional court judgment at paragraph, um, it's at paragraph 91 where Justice Musenegger makes the exact, it's what it seems to me to be the exact opposite or expresses the exact opposite sentiment. He says, our system of separation of powers must give due recognition to the popular will as expressed legislatively, provided that the laws and policies in issues are consistent with constitutional dictates which seems to me to suggest that one should be careful in saying um, that one can apply the law and the constitution impervious to public commentary, because if the public will is something that should be recognized in the judgment making uh, process, it seems to me that's the way that it should go. Professor Madonsela. 
the commission was established in order to unearth the truth of what happened. Um, Mr. Zuma is at the very heart of what the Public Protector's Office sought to be investigated when it approached the full bench a couple of years ago. From the point of view of a purposive application of the law and the constitution, what do you make of the majority's thesis that the role of the judiciary is to apply the law at any and all costs, even if it means that the purpose for which the commission was established is not achieved? Do you think um, that we would still be able to learn the truth from Mr. Zuma when he's in jail. I mean, the majority, for example, in paragraph 50, in paragraph 50 says, the public, and I'm quoting, the public has an equally important, if not more acute interest in a functioning judiciary than in Mr. Zuma testifying before the commission. Now, given the purpose for which the commission was established, do you agree with that sentiment? And take a literal interpretation of what the court says, or we can take a purposive interpretation. I've read the judgment in line with the guidelines council that have been given to us by section 36 of the constitution. The idea being to take a, a purposive interpretation. So I didn't read paragraph 50 alone. I read it in context that the majority judgment explains that there's been all of these processes and including the public statements made by the respondent. And the majority judgment arrives at a conclusion that sending this back and trying to coerce Mr. Zuma to go to the commission is going to be futile. If anything, just more time of the law. So I don't think that, um, it was the intention of the commission to say, if there's a real prospect of former President Zuma attending the commission and giving his views, the, the constitutional court would have deliberately not taken advantage of that pro prospect. I think the conclusion is that there is no um, chance that he is going to avail himself based on what he has said and based on, on, on prior conduct. And again, I'll take a Lord Denning approach. Earlier on, you said I align myself with the, with the main judgment. I don't. I just have said like Lord Denning that I find none of its provisions to be unreasonable irrational or unlawful. So I'm not here to align or not to align. I'm just here to look at, um, was there a, a basis for this judgment to be made? And I find that with the facts before me and the laws that they applied, it is a rational judgment, it is a reasonable judgment, and it is a fair judgment. It's unfortunate that <laughs> I, I just want to talk a little bit about Marx. I used to be a Marxist for many years to the point of being an atheist when I was the young me with a Marx. One of the things that Marx didn't have is an understanding of complexity. And you must remember that he looks at the world from the point of view of Europe at the time after the, the first industrial revolution. And uh, when we look at labor and capital today, it's not that binary. Uh, if you look at capital in South Africa today, there is also black capital, very, very strong. Might be a tiny minority, but there is black capital. And I, I refuse to believe that the courts are there only to save the interests of white people 
and to save the interests of big business. I believed that as a student when I was a Marxist and for a few years after graduating, I believed that. But I think the world is far more complex and far more ambiguous than Marx would have us believe. But secondly, I take issue. I'm not a judge, but I could well be a judge. I take issue with the assumption that judges, the majority of which are black, have no agency, that they're just saving the interests of white monopoly capital or, 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 or white business interests. I take issue with that because that for me may even come across as racist. And, and this is something that we have to think about, uh, about agency, about um, the broader system and structural inequality, which is not just race. In fact, um, Kimberly Crenshaw said in a paper I quoted in my early years when I was still at Verts, in a paper I wrote, all women are white, all black people are men, but some of us are brave. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Well, you've deftly segued, and I use the term deftly, not disparagingly, but um, in its most positive sense. You've deftly segued into a, que a question that I had um, reserved for, for Ms. Keller at the end. Um, and I don't think, and I will let you get away with the fact that I, in my view, I don't think you've directly answered the question I put to you. Uh, but I'll come, I'll come back to that after a while. I'll, uh, I'll let you get away with it for now. But for now, what I want to do is to give Ms. Keller an opportunity, if she is ready to deal with that question, because I was, I was going to deal with it right at the end. Ms. Keller, the, the choice is yours. Do you want to deal with that question now, or do you still want to think about it? Now that Ms. Uh, Professor Matoncela has um, grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and brought it more forward than I had intended to bring it up. Do you want to deal with it now or later? I'm happy to deal with it now, actually. Okay, well, let me phrase it. The question is, you said the judiciary serves white interests. You said rhetorically, could it be that the judiciary is President Ramaphosa's own public protector? The question I want to pose to you is this, and you can broaden it if you want, but please start by answering the way I phrase it. Question is, is there any judgment of which you are aware, reported or not reported, that gives a clear indication of that sentiment? Well, I think I would like to look more broadly than that by just a little, with a little preamble about judges' location within society. I mean, first of all, I think I've argued in my introduction that they're not quarantined from society and neither is the society quarantined from, from the judiciary either. Judges are very much part, of, in my view, of the ruling class and they uphold and supersize the interests of that ruling class. And I mean, this is a historical reality. We see it during apartheid. Legislation was a critical part of the overall arsenal. It's true of regimes across the globe and throughout the ages. So I think we would be naive to say that there's no intersection between law and politics in current day South Africa, as if law is um, depicted in virginal terms, pure, untouched, and without class or individual interests. And I, I would cite this very case as an example of how the judiciary is serving white interests. Because if there's ever a villain to white monopoly capital and to white interests, it's in the person of Jacob Zuma. I look too at how the general justice system is, is conducting its business, where the son of Jacob Zuma, Duduzani Zuma, was shackled like a common criminal you know, those are just two examples. I'm not say, citing exact case laws, but we also have to look at other things, the lack of transformation in the judiciary and uh, as in any organization and institution in so-called in so free South Africa. 
I mean, the language of the courts is English. Black South Africans cannot even defend themselves in their own language. So perhaps I'm giving broader examples, but to me, these are all symptomatic of a judiciary, of an organization, of an institution that is serving the ruling class and particularly white interests, like every other organization in this country, the media, the academia, um, and yes, the judiciary. Okay, thank you. I, I don't want us to get bogged down with one question. You have at least addressed the first um, excerpt, the first part that says judiciary serves white interests. Whether you've done so um, credibly or meritoriously is, is a different question, but you've answered that question. The second part of the question was when you said, could it be that the judiciary is President Ramaphosa's own public protector? I didn't hear you address that question. Do, do you want to deal with it briefly? Yes, let me deal, deal with it very briefly. I do believe that Sir Ramaphosa is a man who doesn't, who is a leader that doesn't like to deal with difficult things on a hands-on basis. I think he likes to leave very difficult decisions to organs of the state so that he's got this seemingly hands-off approach. And it is in that respect that I say that the judiciary has almost become his own public protector. I mean, the the, the, the predictable finding um, on the CR 17 funding yesterday, to me, is an example of that. And I think he's being protected by the judiciary. And yes, I'm aware I'm making very harsh claims, but to me, that is the perception. And until we see the truth behind um, these matters, uh, we, we will continue to be suspicious, a suspicious, bunch of people, a suspicious public and suspicious analysts. Okay, well, speaking for myself, I, I, I still don't see the link, but I, I don't want to dwell too much on, uh, we've got a number of other questions that we need to deal with, but I had to put those questions, those questions to you so that I'm not accused as the moderator of letting people getting away with making general statements without evidence. But thank you for the attempt to deal with it, uh, Ms. Keller. Gogo Mashik, as from a political perspective, do you think that the application of the law and the constitution is always devoid of any political considerations? I mean, in the context of this case study, Mr. Zuma's public political statements were taken into account by the majority as an aggravating factor for meeting out a punitive committal sanction against him. From a political analysis perspective, is there a way in your view of divorcing from the, from the proposition that the judiciary applies the law impervious to any political rhetoric? Well, <laughs> Kati, let me answer you this way. Um, and it can be decided later whether it was from a, a political analysis perspective that I gave you an answer. Uh, but I'm not here as a political um, analyst. I'm here in my nature as a multifaceted being. My, my starting point is that there are conflicting views in South Africa about what constitutes a civilized society. But there is a dominant view about what constitutes such a civilized order. And that dominant view is informed in part by two things by the political reality that South Africa does not belong to all who live in it. In other words, what is contained in the Freedom Charter is aspirational, does not exist in the realm of reality. 
South Africa belongs to those and still belongs to those who conquered it. And that betrays another reality. Because of colonialism and, and apartheid, what in essence is a numerical minority has become a cultural majority whose worldview, whose ways of seeing and whose ways of being are dominant. And in essence, those who are a numerical minority have become a cultural minority. And their worldview, their ways of seeing, and their ways of being are not the dominant reality. Now, some will argue uh, that some of those who are part of this cultural majority are not white. When I make this argument, I am not making it in the simplistic way of suggesting that if I say there are tall people in the world, that means it is my understanding that there are no short people in the world. Whiteness, as a result, for me, is the dominant reality in South Africa. And here I'm not talking about skin color. Some of the purveyors of whiteness are black. I'm talking about whiteness as a way of being, as a way of seeing, as a worldview, as an ideology. So if you look at our institutions, if you look at, for instance, our courts, including the Constitutional Court, what pre-exists their own existence is what I have described. And those of us like you and others who are products of universities and so on, must be humble about what they have achieved because the places at which we, 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 we were educated, as Henry Jerome puts it, are dead zones of disimagination. And so to some extent, even the content of our jurisprudence, even the reality that we call the judiciary is a product amongst other things of these dead zones of disimagination. All right. Thank you, thank you, um, Kogo. I want to move in to Mr. Sikakane. Let's bring you in here. It is rumored that in the 19th century, there was a justice of the US Supreme Court who, when a young man burst into court and demanded to have justice, responded that young man, this is a court of law and not a court of justice. Now, when the constitutional court majority says that the role of the judiciary is to, is to apply the law and the constitution impervious to public sentiment um, and at any and all costs. What in your assessment does that signify? Does that signify that the judiciary in South Africa or the courts by that statement consider them, their role as being that of a court of law or a court of justice? Thank, 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 thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm quite nervous about answering this question. It's a general so, question. Yeah, no, no, no. Not, it has nothing to do with the Zuma case. I'm nervous because judges, politicians, journalists, and lawyers have no a very little capacity for self-reflection. And anything negative said about them is defined in, 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 in negative terms. But I'm going to risk it in this way. First of all, I think that line is like someone who says, I'm not racist. I don't see color. And then they continue to say racist things and act racistly. So it's a disingenuous statement. And I want to end it there. 
But your question about the court of law or court of justice, Vianney, I think the basic characteristic of a modern civilized society should be that of compassion that we've moved away from the lynch mobs of early centuries. Therefore, a court is a court of justice because law is a component of justice. It's to serve justice. And justice is there to serve what I think should be a characteristic of all of us, which is compassion. That I think is the bedrock of any honest activist. Therefore, a court should be there to determine whether the dispute that is before them is handled in a way that is fair, not just to one party, but to both parties that are before them. I'll come to that when we talk about remedy and other things. And therefore that dichotomy of the court of justice and court of law is a false dichotomy. It's a court of justice that practices law and adjudicates matters fairly and justly. Now here's the challenge of justice. As Aubrey said earlier, and it's something I have raised, but people do not seem to think to see it. The test that I am just is how I treat people I despise. That is the test because you, Vianney, as my friend and my colleague, you will always enjoy justice from me because you are my friend. So that's not the test. The test is how do I deal with somebody that I despised and create a process for that person to be treated fairly. That is justice for me. About the judiciary, I think I said earlier that sometimes the contests in society are between those who are ruled and those who are ruling. But of course, there are hidden hierarchies in societies, either because of race or because of what they own. And of course, they operate in different ways. And judges, when you say this about the judiciary, you get attacked because I think judges do not like criticism. I believe that three branches of government must know this. All of them exercise public power and none of them should try to avoid criticism. And judges tell us this about criticism. Oh no, when you criticize us, do it cogently and uh, give us the reasons. Of course, you, you exclude 70% of society when you say people who must criticize you must do that. So my mother cannot criticize the judge because she can't write a cogent legal argument. Of course, no one should be insulted. But I think when judges do that, I, I think it's an abuse of power. I think respect must not be demanded, but must be earned. And all of us who act in that way in positions of power must know that we attract that. The last point I want to say is this, how you exercise justice as a court is the same way you exercise it as a lawyer, as a doctor, and sometimes as, as I say, as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a judge. A doctor who says, there are patients I don't treat because they are too sick is not a doctor. And therefore people who need a lawyer are those who need justice more, the despised, the condemned. So a lawyer who does not do cases for people who are disliked is like a doctor who says, I don't treat people who are too sick. I prefer the ones who have a headache. And judges themselves, I think when they say they are impervious to the views outside, I would better have them honest about their views to say, because we are all biased. If you are to dispense justice, you must first accept that you're biased. And then what makes you a judge is not that you are not biased, is that you are matured enough 
to confront your bias and know that what you do is based on your bias and do something about it. And one of the tragedies in South Africa I see when I watch TV and I see an analyst is that in South Africa, we, we have a shortage of scholastic analysis and inquiry. And what you see is people pouring scorn and being angry, hating this person or that person, and it drives our analysis. And I think that is what hinders societal development because we are, instead of being compassionate, we are a lynch mob that is vindictive and we are unable to advance society in that way. And as I said, Vuyani, people remember that you represent Zuma or Cyril Ramaphosa or Ace Mahashule, and they get emotional, but they don't remember my colleagues who live nice lives representing apartheid killers. No one knows their names. No one condemns them. Professor DeForce does not write about them. People who killed our people threw them right through the 10th floor windows. He doesn't. That choice itself goes back to what I was saying to you. It's law and politics, and we must honestly accept that that contest in society sometimes drives our responses, and judges must try by all means to remove themselves from that. And I don't believe the problem in South Africa in the judiciary is corruption, as many people do when they attack judges. I truly don't, because I know hundreds of men and women who are judges who work every day tirelessly under difficult conditions to settle disputes. But I think the problem in South Africa in the judiciary may well be, and I'm not saying this arrogantly, is that as matters get bigger, we do have a shortage of what I call intellectual pedigree to deal with those matters that are, con that are sensitive in society. It's not corruption, it's a failure and we must deal with it in the manner in which we appoint judges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skakan. Um, I, I take it the short answer is the courts are the courts of justice and not so much the courts of law. They are both. They are both, but principally justice rather than law, or equally justice and law. No, principally justice. Yes, okay, thank you. Professor Madonsela, let me elevate you, if it's possible to elevate you um, to greater heights. The majority judgment says there is no precedent for our courts finding in a case in which a solely punitive order of immediate committal has been made or where punishment is not calculated to compel a recalcitrant to comply with the initial order. That's what the majority says. That's what the minority says. There is no precedent for what the majority has done in this case. But it says the level of contempt by Mr. Zuma is unprecedented and therefore requires an unprecedented remedy to meet it. And so for that reason, it felt compelled to develop the contempt jurisprudence by jailing him. 